So I want to thank you all for um, joining us tonight. I ask you to either turn off your video and your mute um, so that you don't interfere with the uh, presentation tonight. But it really is such a thrill to be able to offer you um, this Regenerate Now Masterclass, which tonight is going to be around the world of the leaf. And it builds on two other masterclasses that we have ar archived, which you can access in our YouTube um, channel, which you can find through the For the Love of Bees website. And the first masterclass focuses on soil and answers the question, what is it? The second masterclass looks at microbial networks beneath the ground and how to work in your garden to establish those and why it is so important. The Regenerate Now platform has been um, co-created by the For the Love of Bees community and primarily for um, the Urban Farmers Alliance network, which uh, we are now mentoring. Um, there are over 70 participants in the growing and composting space primarily mentored by Daniel um, Sherman, who will be presenting to you tonight. What we've been able to offer is a WhatsApp um, mentoring uh, uh, capability, which enables farmers and composters to ask questions on a, on a daily basis and be um, you know, supported by their peer network, as well as by Daniel. We have um, the Regenerate Now Instagram takeover, which Jess Barnes, um, is actually doing this week. And this gives our early adopter farms an opportunity to share with you, learning that they're doing in their actual farms. And then there's the farmer in the field session, which again, we did today with Jess, which will be uh, available for you to view on our archive. And this actually enables a farmer to have a one hour mentoring session in the field with some of our Regenerate Now mentors. This is all archived and um, so that you can actually learn alongside us and is, is done live via Zoom. But here we are today in our masterclass. Um, I'm really uh, so thrilled that you have joined us. The vision is that Regenerate Now is a platform that enables anyone who wants to learn how to engage with biology first organic regenerative practices on a site to embed food security, local jobs, through processes that actually help us repair ecosystems and develop climate change resilience. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Daniel, um, and I'm really looking forward to the session. Thanks a lot, Tara. Um, welcome along everybody um, to this uh, third masterclass. Um, we're gonna be talking about what I call a phylosphere um, and the microbial systems that support it. Essentially that means everything um, above the ground um, as far as a plant is concerned. Uh, so if we can get <coughs> to work for us today. Um, I'll start with a short video um, that is kind of a nice quick summary um, to start us off um, shortly from the Soil Food Web. Uh, and then we'll follow on with um, a, a series of topics around nitrogen fixation, um, disease management uh, without the sides, the quorums, quorum sensing and quorum quenching and, and how they are um, changing the entire way that we um, think about the microbial system um, in and around the plant and, um, and, so, and, and with our own bodies. Um, frost damage, um, many people might not think of that <clears throat> as a pest or um, disease, but it certainly causes economic loss, but it isn't what most people think it is. Insects um, and nature's perfect blueprint um, and tools to measure plant health. So and I keep... would encourage people, if you have a question, please use the chat, uh, the chat function and I will um, ask those questions to Daniel on your behalf. Okay, thanks for that, Sarah. And we'll <clears throat> keep going and now we'll see if we can get this short video to play like it has every other time I've tried it. So, how does the soil food web inhibit pests and diseases? Well, if you've watched the animation on building soil structure, then you'll know that a well-structured soil is a hostile environment for most disease-causing microorganisms. That's because these anaerobic organisms don't do well in an oxygen-rich environment. This means that they are easily outcompeted by the beneficial aerobic microorganisms that do thrive in oxygen-rich environments. 
Access to foods for the anaerobic microorganisms is severely limited by the competition from the beneficial aerobic microorganisms, making life even more difficult. The sugars and carbs that are put out by the plant are released from the roots in order to feed beneficial microorganisms, as explained in the animation on nutrient cycling. Naturally, these beneficial organisms congregate around the roots. In fact, they totally cover the surfaces of the roots in order to get immediate access to this valuable food source, thus making it very difficult for anaerobic organisms to access the food supplied by plants. As the surface of the roots are covered by beneficial organisms, the microscopic infection sites which the disease-causing organisms are looking for cannot be accessed. So the plant roots are very well protected against infection. But what about the above ground part of the plant? Well, it just so happens that plants release sugars and carbs from their leaves too, and from their stems and fruit. In fact, from all parts of the living plant. And the beneficial microorganisms can be found there too, feeding on the compounds being released by the plant and providing protection to the infection sites in return. Here's an interesting thought. Imagine picking an apple from a tree and the surface of that apple being completely covered in beneficial microorganisms. What effect do you think nature's little defense force might have on your gut biome? So without access to food and facing oxygen-rich soil conditions, the bad guys are severely weakened. Many of them are consumed by aerobic predators. Insect pests can also be a problem for farmers. These are much larger than the disease-causing microorganisms we just looked at. But real-world trials have shown that with a balanced soil food web in place, insect pests are deterred from attacking the healthy plants that are grown. Healthy plants produce chemicals that deter pests, whilst plants that are stressed are less able to do this, and so they're more susceptible to attack. Having the soil food web in place results in cost savings for farmers, as they no longer need to spend time and money spraying pesticides. And they also see their yields increase as less plants are attacked. According to the UN, pesticides are largely to blame for the decimation of insect populations by approximately 25% per decade over the last 30 years. Bird populations are also crashing as a consequence. There is mounting evidence that the human biome is one of the most important factors in human health. Could eating food grown in natural soils be good for our health? We at the Soil Food Web School think so. Want to grow pest and disease resistant plants? Sign up for the foundation courses today. Right, so that's a, a brief um, and basic introduction to what happens um, in connection the main uh, in connection with the microbial system um, both in the soil and on the plant the main reason i showed that was it is not well uh, or often well understood that um, the actual leaf um, and uh, the phylosphere area of the plant is totally reliant on the same on a microbial workforce just like the uh, rhizosphere or the root system of the plant and it is just as complex, many of the similar sort of rules and functions govern it. Um, and one of the things that's also not well understood, um, because in many cases <clears throat> through our practices, it doesn't happen um, all that much in commercial crops, is that um, nitrogen fixation we know happens around legumes, but also nitrogen fixing bacteria actually live on the leaves of plants. There's a whole group of bacteria. There are literally hundreds of species that actually fix nitrogen out of the air. They're like the N2 nitrous oxide um, in the air and they, they take that nitrogen, being fed the carbon by the plant as we saw in the video, just like the microbes in the roots. Um, and those microbes, you take that carbon and combine it with nitrogen um, and they make nitrogen available to plants and also populate the plant surface um, using those ingredients. The reason that it's not well understood and um, not really considered uh, in, in the past in conventional agriculture is because broad spectrum fungicides, um, like copper fungicides for argument's sake, basically that kill everything. They kill all these beneficial um, bacteria off as well. Um, so all of those wonderful beneficial organisms that are providing um, benefits to the plant, like nitrogen from the air, um, doesn't occur when you're constantly bombarding them with fungicides in particular um, and other agrochemicals um, that actually are constantly killing them off. 
The other area when you start looking at nitrogen fixation is those particular group of organisms are very reliant on cobalt and molybdenum. Um, two nutrients that are very rarely, probably 99% of the time, they are not on um, soil analysis or measured for at all, yet without those two nutrients being available, those little organisms actually can't do the job that they need to do. They can't fix the nitrogen. So it becomes important to actually understand not just that those organisms exist, what they do, but what you actually need to do to support that process. But it's a sort of a little understood fact um, that that nitrogen fixation process is happening on every leaf surface if, we have, if we're not killing it off. Um, we're going to jump straight into um, some of the symptoms um, and why we, uh, and later on we'll explain why we see these symptoms and what, what causes these various different things to create these exudates. What we're looking at here is uh, the first two pictures are kiwi fruit PSA, which almost everybody listening to this will be um, we're familiar with, which is a Pseudomonas syring syringi actina. Um, and this is a apple tree canker, uh, two of the biggest um, disease issues that um, horticultural crops uh, face in New Zealand. And their only answer um, for us here at the moment is pretty much the conventional answer is to spray copper fungicides um, to control that. We've got some more diseases. In this case, we're looking at uh, the first one is downy mildew. Um, again, the only answer that we're looking here um, for control in pretty much all cases is just to spray preventatively with uh, fungicides. A whole raft of fungicides um, are, are utilised to try and control this uh, disease. Um, the interesting thing about downy mildew is it's actually an Emocetes mould. It's not actually a true fungi at all and it's systemic. Um, so it's actually coming from inside um, the plant and expressing the symptom um, which blocks up the vascular um, system of the plant and starts this leaf splotching and degradation. And the reason it's called downy mildew, if anybody's ever experienced it, is because the leaves drop um, down very, very rapidly uh, once this disease occurs. My first experience and the last time I actually um, ever used a fungicide personally on a crop, and it goes back a long time now, was with this disease, which was the number one disease that we dealt with in uh, commercial rose crops. Um, and we would spray every single week of the year pretty much for downy mildew um, and for many, many years with the same chemistry, which is completely flawed, but that's what we were taught to do. When uh, we saw this disease express itself and we were working with microbials in the early days, we uh, sort of lost our nerve a little bit and sprayed um, a fungicide that we hadn't used for quite a while. We immediately saw within the space of 24 hours that the disease progression was actually significantly worse. So we took a gamble and we sprayed more of the microbial beneficial. Um, at that stage, it was a product called Neutralife 420. And that we were brewing up and sprayed on the crop. And what was amazing to me is that what I saw um, again overnight, the next 24 hours, something I'd never ever seen a fungicide do or any other control mechanism, but we actually stopped the only mildew in its tracks. And one of the ways that we discovered that that happened is if you grab this leaf in this stage and just touch it, it literally falls off just at the slightest touch. 24 hours after spraying the second lock of, second lock of my, microbials, so basically we lifted the numbers and, and sprayed it on. Um, these leaves couldn't be pulled off. We could literally pull the plants over um, on uh, these damaged leaves and uh, immediately told us that we had actually stopped the fungi, um, or the Mercedes mold, um, downy mildew in its track. And we'd never ever seen that in, in, the, in the decades of experience that we've had with that disease. Uh, it was the last time I lost my nerve using beneficial microbes. There are other diseases that we, we, common, that we commonly see, which are all microbial pathogens. Powdery mildew, um, and is, is this obviously very well, clearly called powdery mildew, is a white powder that's on and over the plant and over the leaves and flowers. And then we've got rust. And the reason I group these two together, although this is on the bottom of the leaves and they look totally different, 
is that these two diseases are what we call, um, they're, they're symptoms of poor cell structure. They, even when we were spraying chemistry, um, you had a little chance of controlling this particular very well. It was all about nutrition, even back then. It was about getting the nutrition right. Um, and, and these are really a very, very strong sign of um, poor nutrition levels in a plant. And that literally is all about, in this case, about poor cell strength. So different disease symptoms, and we now look in different ways, tells us different things, but it's very interesting now that this was <clears throat> a crop. Um, some of you may have seen this picture before, but this was a crop of commercial roses that we grew um, and we, we developed over many years for a, a program to grow without any of the fungicides, insecticides, and, um, and it all went completely into uh, using beneficial organisms sprayed in their place um, and fed into the root system. Um, and we managed to create a, a vastly, vastly improved quality, quantity, crop, um, it, with the difference is just mind blowing when we think about what we were doing with fungicides versus using um, beneficials. It's just an example of the extreme nature of what we used to spray half a dozen agrochemicals a week um, on a crop like this, which now we are growing without any of that um, chemistry. We have a question, um, Daniel. And uh, it's quite a sort of, um, it's a, you know, anyway, the question is, do you think this could be effective against myrtle rust? It's really interesting when someone, I, actually I knew that when I put rust up there, I almost put myrtle rust up on that picture, but I decided I'd stick with, with the same. Roses show disease so beautifully. Um, yes, there isn't, whenever we talk about disease, the causes of disease or a plant suffering disease is through our mismanagement um, or the environment's mismanagement around that plant. It's never about the disease itself. Um, the fact that myrtle rust is hard to kill um, is no, no different than the fact that rust is hard to kill. The fact that the plant is suffering from uh, myrtle rust or any other form of rust, or as I said in the case of powdery mildew, is all about plant health. It's all about the microbial diversity. The only reason the myrtle rust um, poses a problem um, for um, plants in all reality, just like any other disease, is because the opportunity exists to attack weak plants. Does that answer that question? I think enough. I think let's move on to the next slide. So <clears throat> what we're going to talk about in, in terms of understanding the whole microbial system and these the, the next two um, slides we're going to be discussing some concepts that some of you will probably be familiar with the wording but maybe not so much the actual understanding of the science behind it and the science only goes back about 10 years ago when um, it was really uh, discovered and, and published and what we're going to talk about is, and, and I'll explain why it's important as we go along but it's, the, it's a critical understanding, the understanding of this science, which is called quorum sensing, um, which has led us to better be able to work with nature. Because essentially what we're talking about here is the language that, or the communication system, that bacteria, and probably by default, every microorganism on the planet follows some form of communication. In this case, what we found with quorum sensing is that an individual species produces, um, I call them little proteins, but um, um, let's just stick with that. They're like a key, um, but it's, it's part of the language that a specific species and every species has found being found to have its own language. In fact, every, we'll talk about the fact that every, one of these organisms is actually bilingual, but the first language they talk is the one that allows them to tell how many um, of their kind are present. And the number or the quorum that they get out of that process tells them um, like an automatic program as to what to do next. So the more of these little um, uh, you know, 
membranes that are floating around that can plug into, the more that they, uh, they come from a dormant state. So at this point where there's not many, it's very low density, the organisms pretty much by default stay dormant. That's why you, when you look at um, analysis of what there is present in any surface, any surface analysis, DNA analysis on anything, whether it's the surface of skin, the surface of a plant, the surface of a wall, there are billions of microorganisms and, and many of them are sitting there and sometimes in, in completely dormant states, particularly when we talk about um, pathogens, and we don't really, didn't really understand what suddenly made an organism that was always present actually become virulent and start causing issues. And it's partly to do with this language. So when the competition starts to decline for whatever reason, an environmental issue, um, interference, predation, other organisms activity, when those numbers start to increase, the organisms switch into multiplication mode and they, they wake up and they start multiplying and the more of these little things. So they've only got one, this key only fits them. Um, and so as they keep coming through, you'll see the explanation of what actually happens down in the bottom corner here as these things come in and they, they there's actually a way of swapping DNA material um, between the different bacteria so that the ones that survive can pass on um, anything, uh, any of their um, resistance that they've learned through this process. So this is also happening at the same time. As the numbers build up and the competition isn't, uh, isn't present to slow them down, they reach this stage and we see the word called biofilm. Um, and which is what you saw when I showed you the kiwi fruit and the apple canker, as you saw that exudate the, the oozing out of the tree, that's a form of biofilm when the organisms have reached such a large number that they start to create this, this, this. So in this point, they've become a very highly virulent um, problem for the, the host. Um, uh, obviously, if they're a pathogen, not if they're beneficial, but at this point, they're, they're actually now looking for an exit strategy and that exudate essentially is their exit strategy. But there's another language that they speak and this is where they become bilingual. They not only can count, how many of their own organisms are present, but they're also there's an international language that they all speak, which tells them how many of everybody else is present. And so by, um, they won't actually start increasing in number unless they detect that there's actually a vacuum or a void or there's room for this increase of productivity uh, production, so multiplication process goes on. So there's a communication process that is happening. And, the understanding, we, we learned this 10 years ago of trying to understand our bacteria function um, and, and this quorum sensing came about, it started to make people think in terms of, you know, how do we manage bacteria? And they were looking particularly in terms of, of antibiotic um, resistance. Um, so there's, so sort to be clear, we've got two communication, pro two, two languages happening here. One is that knows how many of their own kind of present and the other one is determine how many of the competition are present, and that's really important. <clears throat> Even less, only about seven years ago, we, um, they discovered uh, another aspect to this. So there are organisms in there communicating, and then there's organisms in there that they're a way of competing with the, the, the other organisms, because obviously there's a constant uh, battle raging in this micro, um, uh, in the microbiological um, sphere all around us. And um, some of those organisms have developed a unique way to compete. And we, we call it quorum quenching, but essentially what we have is an organism that shuts down that communication. They interrupt the communication system. They either do it by blocking so that the, uh, the, the other bacteria can't actually access. So they get the message that nobody else is there and they go back to being dormant. Um, or they consume the, um, as I just described before, these little keys that were floating around. They run around and eat them all up um, by there also, meaning that the competition simply go back to being dormant. And these are really interesting from the point of view, again, of further understanding what's really happening and how can we actually use that knowledge to manage um, the, uh, the plant health system better. I'm gonna show you an example at the moment of uh, an extreme example. Many people 
aren't aware of is the fact that frost damage in plants is actually a microbial process. Uh, the simple thought that something uh, freezes and the temperature gets low enough, so therefore whatever the liquid is um, freezes, isn't actually um, entirely the right um, telling you everything that you need to know. Um, frost process is actually largely a bacterial process. So er and every frost molecule has a nucleus and the nucleus of that molecule um, in most situations is actually what they call an ice nucleate, nucleating bacteria. And so the frost um, a molecule forms around that nucleus. And that most common ice nucleating bacteria that is, is known and all of studying has been, you, everything you read about it is on, is actually Pseudomonas syringae. And that's the same organism, uh, related organism that we're talking about in PSA, um, for argument's sake, and also in a number of other um, diseases that is a bacteria that forms that nucleus and it can cause a frost to occur at actually above or frost damage to occur at above zero degrees and the reason it's doing that is it's, it's using, using that system to damage the plant tissue so that it can actually um, feed into the plant and, and, um, and feed on it and that's one of the keys that we've seen in PSA and serious frost events and Winter has led to um, much bigger PSA symptoms as the leaves come out um, in spring. But what we discovered is there's a non-ice nucleating bacteria, a group um, also Pseudomonas, but these are known as Pseudomonas fluorescens. And they have a, there's a group there that if you spray them on the plant, they happen to be known to be quorum quenches. And they shut down the communication system of the Pseudomonas syringae and they can do this overnight, as in we spray on um, Pseudomonas fluorescens as an example, um, and uh, you, end, you can have a minus five degree frost, which is frequently experienced by avocado guys and Bay of Plenty, um, and where we spray um, the Pseudomonas fluorescens onto the crop, we suffer no uh, frost damage. Um, and one evidence, unfortunately, we've got a picture of it, a grower had said to me that he missed spraying half a tree, uh, came back about 10 days later to notice in his orchard that he had half a, half a tree that was brown leaves and half a tree that was all healthy until he worked out. That's actually where his stuff sprayer had stopped working to show you the effectiveness um, of having a much better understanding and utilising these tools that we have um, available. But it just goes to show you that that whole, it's, it's based around understanding quorum sensing and getting enough of the beneficials present, the pathogens or the disease forming organisms, in this case, the frost causing um, organisms, um, don't stand um, a hope. They just simply get told to be shut down by using their own language. There is some research I did find that people have been using copper fungicides to spray to kill the Pseudomonas syringae, which is the ice nucleating bacteria on the leaves, and in that way reducing frost damage. But you can imagine as we go on and explain, there are definite disadvantages to um, killing everything while you're trying to prevent frost damage. There's another very important group um, of organisms um, that you find on the leaf surface. They're also found in the soil, but in this case, we're talking about, they're known as entomopathogenic um, fungi. There are bacteria that fit this group as well, but we'll focus a little bit on the fungi here. And what these are, they see these organisms, they see insects as food. So they land on the insect. Um, the insect doesn't consume them as, a lot of people believe that they, they eat them off the plant surface. No, they actually land on the, the insect as they're blowing um, through the, the wind as, as, and then they, they eat the insect from the inside out. And when they finish their job, they create fruiting structures so that they can release more spores into the air um, to feed on other insects. The amazing thing, and, and, and still very hard to believe, is that they do not appear to bother our beneficial predator insects. So um, these wonderful um, beneficial microbes uh, can be utilized um, without fear, um, it would appear of harm to our beneficial predators that would otherwise be helping us control these insect pests. 
Um, so now we move on to plant's immune system, and we call it immune system response, or IS, ISR, as it is very often referred to. So a plant's immune system, and someone probably sat and wonder, what does this have to do with the microbial system on the leaves? Well, it doesn't produce antibodies. Um, the plant's immune system doesn't appear to produce antibodies like ours, so that's what science is telling us at the moment. It requires constant stimulation to keep the plant healthy. So to keep that immune system functioning, it has quite constant stimulation. It's the microbials that provide that stimulation. So both beneficial or pathogenic on the plant surface, uh, it constantly create, creating that stimulation. Using pesticides um, to kill off, um, so I'm talking about fungicides um, as well, um, but any of those chemicals that damage those beneficial microbes um, or pathogens in this case, um, and if you do that continuously, it's like antibiotics um, damaging our gut flora, which also harms our immune system. If you don't have the microbials there, the plant's immune system won't function, so now it totally relies on us to constant, constantly spray them, which we wouldn't have to be doing um, with chemistry if we understood how this works. Now, the plant's immune system response, um, it can be measured, and it's phytochemicals, and you were talking that the video right at the beginning of this talked about chemicals that the plant releases and produces to defend itself. Well, they've found there's over, over more than 6,000 of these phytochemicals have been identified, probably more all the time. You all know them as things like anthocyanin, carotenoids, flavonoids, phenolics, vitamin C. These, that's just a few, obviously, of the, of the uh, example of a few of them. And you can see those are the compounds that often make us want to eat certain types of foods because they're high in these antioxidants. The, we know the health benefits associated with eating uh, foods that contain these phytochemicals. But foods contain vastly less phytochemicals, in some cases none at all, in the case of sometimes of vitamin C, which you would have seen at times with fruit, that should have been very high in vitamin C and at times has been found to contain none. And that's largely because how we're treating the plants and not understanding what produces these compounds in the plants. And that is all about the microbial system that is in and around and on the plants uh, that we are constantly destroying. We have another question, Daniel. And, um, sure. and uh, the question is about neem oil. And I, I think it's quite a good question because obviously we're told it's organic. But how does that um, affect the capacity of this plant to, um, you know, what's its impact? Really interesting, actually. Um, years ago, when we were um, in the early days of, of, of learning this and, and learning how to use it in commercial horticulture, we had a fantastic recipe and it involved neem oil, a, 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 dye, a DDAC, which is a product called Parfix, in uh, another one called Precision MD, and these are three chemicals, okay, neem, oil, organic registered, or whatever it happens to be, it's still essentially, uh, it's, a, it's a, an organic chemistry, but we put it together with the other three products. And we could kill any pest, any disease on the plant, uh, to the point where we thought, well, why are we bothering with all this other stuff? But it turned out that after a while, oils put, and neem oil, but mineral oil is worse, neem oil is still an oil, it, the oil builds up on the leaves of plants and actually shuts down the respiration process. And when I looked it into it further, I found the typical things that we call like mineral oils that we were using to spray on trees as organic uh, compounds. If you took a citrus plant and you sprayed it with one application of mineral oil, you actually shut down its respiration process for up to 30 days, um, which is critical to the growth of the plant. So what we saw when we were using neem oil on a regular basis, although it appeared to be almost a miracle together with these two other chemicals, um, what it actually did over a period of time was reduce growth. Um, so we were doing nothing to stimulate growth. Um, you know, so neem oil in itself has benefits. Actually the best way to use neem oil, I found later on, is actually if you're gonna use neem oil, feed it to the roots of the plant. Don't spray it on the leaves of the plant. 
Yes, well, that was the next question. Would it be better to use the granules in the soil? Um, and and I, then there was another question while we've got two questions. Um, would aloe, aloe folia spray also shut down respiration system as it's gummy? So there are two questions no. there. First of all, yeah. the, granule, the granules. Yeah. So the question about granules is my question is, why are you using them? Because many people use them as um, an insecticide. And the truth is that if you actually follow through what we're learning here today, the necessity for using, and we're just about to discover discuss actually um, products like that, which are called biopesticides, uh, these natural occurring um, uh, organism, organisms or compounds that we can use to control um, disease. But it's still essentially, uh, it's still basically replacing a fungicide with another product that is doing more or less the same, a little bit like using copper fungicide. You've really got to ask the question, what's the cause of the symptom that you're having to use the neem granules for? If you want to really fix the symptom, it's you shouldn't be looking at neem granules, you should be looking at actually repairing the soil health um, so that you don't need to be trying to kill all those insects and we'll explain why that's the case shortly. The other thing is that now aloe vera isn't an oil. Um, so there's a very, very different, uh, I've never found, aloe vera is also a microbial stimulant. So it is about stimulating um, particularly fungi um, and it's a whole range. I mean, it's a very, very complex, um, uh, I guess, um, product that we're actually putting it sounds simple to take aloe vera but um, you're taking essentially the sap of one plant and spraying on another but it's it's all more about feeding that plant um, than, than necessarily doing anything so i've never noticed anything other than a growth response from aloe vera um, a positive one um, not that i've not like neem where we've seen negatives um, of it being used on a frequent basis on the leaves just one more question since we're in this space. Um, and this is a question by um, Judy Keats and there's, and there's quite a lot of neem oil questions occurring. Um, the granules apparently are commonly recommended for the control of guava moth. Um, and then there's another question, does neem oil have any negative effect on the soil food web? So there are two questions for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so using the granules, you're feeding it, you're trying to feed it through the roots into the plant. And obviously, again, what you're talking about there is um, the compounds that you're getting from the neem uh, is, is obviously um, trying to get the plant to express whatever it is that would um, prevent um, guava moth. But um, I suggest that there are probably more effective um, ways of doing that. Uh, I'm not saying that neem granules don't have use but um, I wouldn't look at them to um, I would be looking at the reasons to why I have a problem with um, species um, attacking my plants which is what we'll go further into shortly um, so whether it's a, that moth or any other um, and sorry Sarah what was the other question you asked so the other question was does neem oil have any right. negative effect on the soil food we I I am not um, aware of any negative associated as far as the soil system goes with neem, but I suspect it's almost like any other input. If you put in an excessive amount of it, there is almost certainly um, a response to it and potentially where it's been used to kill things, um, there is a potential that it is having, but I don't know of that. It's not something, I mean, I used to use neem many years ago. I don't have any use for it personally uh, in any programs that we write anymore. It doesn't play a part because we simply don't need to use that type of approach. Um, and and I think that answers the next question, which is essentially still this question around neem used as a preventative measure in India a lot towards overall health and an additional to more targeted applications in response to particular pathogens. And I think the, quest, the answer to that is that um, when you are having uh, disease issues, you're reaching for these things. And I guess yeah. what we're, we're really looking at right now is creating a, an environment where those disease pressures actually aren't um, present.
Yeah. I also, um, as it turns out, I work quite a lot with growers in India. Um, and same token as we do not um, rely on neem oil there in any great way, shape or form either. So it has been traditional, but then so was ploughing and copper fungicides. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that we should carry on using um, that approach. Um, where we understand that there is maybe a better way to um, to deal with those problems. So I think we'll move on because we're now yep. at um, 22. Yep. So that kind of neem kind of fits into this model of biopesticides. The most common one that you would um, may know is what is known as BTK or Bacillus thuringiensis kustaki, which is a bacteria that is commonly used uh, and sold as a biopesticide in our garden centres um, and, and used, um, which is for killing um, Lepidoptera, caterpillars, um, moths, and those sorts of uh, moths and butterflies. Um, it's a very uh, blunt tool, um, so if you like butterflies, don't use it, um, because it is indiscriminate. Um, wherever you spray it, it will attack those sorts of species, and they're quite broad um, in their approach, and I'm not a, it's also the main, um, uh, one of the main, uh, they use an exudate of that um, BTK in um, bioengineered um, plants for pest resistance and there's a lot of misuse. It's also an organism that can cause um, people, if you get um, too much of it sprayed or ingested, quite a lot of distress. Um, so it's something that needs a little bit to be used with a little bit more caution than perhaps we, we do sometimes give it. Um, and the problem with them is that literally there are people that throw out the biopesticides and, and the version of um, promoting them as an alternative to chemicals. They're right, they replace um, a range of chemistry at times, um, but all they're doing is replacing one chemical basically with potentially a product um, like neem or beneficial organisms, they haven't actually adapted the growing system or changed the, um, the cause of the pestle disease. They haven't understood why they're suffering that pestle disease. They've just simply moved from one chemical um, to a biopesticide um, and seen that as a solution um, where actually they haven't um, actually got to the cause of their problem at all. Um, and while they're doing that, of course, is the fact that while not allowing those plants um, and, and to grow and express their full genetic potential, um, the benefits of that to our ecosystem to support biodiversity, um, including the animals who consume them, is all um, being missed. So they're at best biopesticides, and I'll put name in here, is at best as a temporary tool um, while we achieve real soil and plant health. And here we get to now understand the science behind why and what causes, uh, I guess, the, the insect pest pressures in particular um, that we suffer on plants. But there's also a link here to understand how we can understand the susceptibility of plant also to bacterial and fungal conditions. Um, I did send out um, to those that are on the WhatsApp group um, uh, an interview between Dr. Phil Callahan and Graham Sait 20 years ago. Um, in 2000, that um, interview went about. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's now the late Dr. Callahan, but um, in this time, uh, he was um, a scientist that studied, um, in particular, energy um, uh, levels, energy effects, and energy. Um, outputs of plants and trying to understand the world from purely from an energy um, perspective, a very, very different um, way that he thought about um, the world around us than very, very, well, very almost anybody other than I've ever heard of than maybe Nikola Tesla. Um, in this case, what he discovered uh, firstly is, is feelers on insects are very sophisticated antenna, so capable of sensing a variety of signals, including the infrared spectrum. And entomologists will only really look in terms of pheromones. Um, what he looked at was, well, what's actually, what, what's the energy source behind those pheromones? Where are they coming from? Um, and so what Can he- Can you explain what a pheromone is, Daniel? Okay, so pheromone is like a scent that attracts an insect 
um, sometimes a male to a female or female to a male or whatever, um, or in this case, um, sends out a pheromone that tells the insect that I'm not, um, for, I'm not edible, um, and, and the, the, uh, the sort of food we were sort of trying to show us a picture of this unhealthy plant that had this incapable sending out these defense mechanisms that a healthy plant is. And so Dr. Hagelin was busy trying to understand really how to measure this, you know, what, without looking at a plant and seeing that it's sick, why would some insects go and feed on one plant next to another uh, to, to, the, to the naked eye, we could maybe determine the difference. And what he, what he demonstrated was that a, a nutrient deficient plant, so a plant that hasn't got this full um, system functioning for it, um, emits a staccato of infrared light. So if you imagine a, like a strobe light going off, um, a healthy plant emits a constant uh, energy uh, signal, infrared signal. Um, so the insect uh, can determine a difference between a plant that has this um, nutrient uh, density, uh, and we'll go further into this in a minute, versus the plant that's actually the sick plant. Because he sees the, the insects in, uh, we, I guess in conventional agriculture, we think of insects as pests, as things to be killed. But uh, Hallahan thought of them more as part of, well, they have, they're part of nature's perfect blueprint. What part do they have to play? And he used to call them the garbage collectors. Their role was to take out the garbage, just to get rid of the weak plants. Um, and, uh, and, and that's why they could have this um, sense. And we'll get a little bit further into in a minute why a plant, um, why an insect might stay away from a plant that has this high nutrient density. Um, and what I want to do is there's a few tools. Obviously, we can't run around measuring uh, probably what is incredibly uh, delicate equipment to required to be measured from I understand infrared uh, em emissions from plants. But he discovered that there were other measurements that correlated with whether a plant was emitting this uh, infrared um, a staccato message or it had the infrared uh, continuous light on. And he found you, if you measured sap, plant sap, um, and we can do this using a sap pH meter, um, and if the plant sap was um, low, uh, then it was susceptible to fungal disease. If a plant sap uh, has a high um, pH, it's more susceptible to bacterial disease. If it has either high or low pH, insects will attack it. And so the immediate question becomes, what is the ideal pH? And it turns out it's 6.3. It's exactly the same as we say the ideal pH is in soil. And that is because that's the ideal pH for every, any living cell, including our own. The other measurement that we can use that correlates, that helps us understand how resistant our um, plants are to pest and disease is using a refractometer or a bricks meter. Um, this can be used to use both nutrient density because you can't have high bricks without nutrient density because bricks is essentially a measurement of all nutrition in the plant. And unless that is in a, a, a balanced form, it can't achieve this high um, BRICS reading. But we can also use it to measure calcium and, and boron deficiencies. Um, so this is how we use it. You know, if you're not familiar with a, a refractometer or a BRICS meter, that, that's, what I've, that's what this device is here. This thing here is called an advanced sap extractor. And then typically people would use a garlic press, but some plants are notoriously hard to get sap out of. So the NTS guys developed, they put, they basically created a little couple of, unfortunately I don't know how to better picture, but essentially these are two C-shaped sections that form together. So if you put a leaf in there, basically the sap will dribble out and this thing can squeeze sap out of pretty much anything. And we have one that's even more, more aggressive than, than this, but this, this usually works for most things. Um, where a garlic press often you will um, turn blue in the face trying to squeeze some things to get um, sap out of them. You have 10 more minutes, um, yep. Daniel. 
will be there. So what we're looking for, if we look through a refractometer, this is kind of what we, we see when we look through. If you've never looked through one, this little line down here tells us here that we have a Brix of four in pretty much every situation known to mankind that is dreadful. Um, but you'll see that's a very sharp line over here. And what we've got at the top is that showing us is poor calcium levels. When the line is actually quite hard to determine whether we're actually on 11 or 12 and it's sort of fuzzy, that actually tells us there's good calcium levels in that sap or in that plant. Boron, it's a little bit more, a, a little d different. It takes two tests. One you do in the afternoon when the bricks is highest. As bricks rises each day or should rise each day as the sun comes up and the plant generates all the bricks in its leaves and overnight it goes through when it goes through its respiration process and it sends it down into the roots and out of the, the, the plant to feed the microorganisms around it, the bricks falls and it goes through this constant um, rising and falling every day. If it doesn't, and this is where we, we find that if we do a test in the afternoon when it's highest and the following morning we do another bricks test and it should be at its lowest, or it should be lower. So the drop should be significant. If it doesn't drop significantly and the drop's very small, it means boron is deficient. And uh, because boron is responsible um, for that um, system that basically opens a valve essentially and allows the, um, the sugars and the carbohydrates to flow down out um, down through the plant. And if that if boron's not present in sufficient quantities, that process can't happen in the plant. Very restrictive um, in the ability of the plant to grow uh, through that process alone. Um, and obviously it's going a long way to starving the microbial network around the roots. We have two questions. Yep. Does um, a question um, from Sasha is, can sap pH and bricks level vary within different parts of the plant? Um, as a rule, not so much. Um, there'll be obviously can be some variation, but as a general rule, um, we would say uh, no. And does it vary on a sunny versus a cloudy day? Absolutely. So what causes variation? Essentially, it's the photosynthesis production. So photosynthesis produces um, that process that produces those sugars. Um, that's the essential function. And when you have less light, you have less photosynthesis happening. So you have less uh, sugars being produced. So the plant cannot produce those bricks levels. Um, the other interesting thing is you can find if you've got a sudden um, loss of bricks and you've got a sunny day and your bricks testing has been going quite well. And all of a sudden there is, have been experiences where the plant is able to obviously sense a lot more than we can and they respond to atmospheric pressures and if atmospheric pressures suddenly drop, that's telling us that there's a storm on the way. Plants can use the movement of those sugars in them out, down into the root system as a defense mechanism. Um, so uh, they almost work a little bit like a... Um, How would that be a defense mechanism, Daniel? You would take the carbohydrates that they're required to replace all the growth that's lost on the plant through the storm. So when right. you have a, like a plant in winter that goes through senescence, it drags all the carbohydrates out of the leaves. That's why they you know, take all, all the chlorophyll, everything they can out of the leaves, and they drop the leaves because they no longer have any use and it's part of its defense mechanism and it stores all of that in the plant. So it has all that energy to produce new leaves. So that's why it's a defense mechanism. Do you understand that? Yeah, and no, I do. Uh, there's okay. one more question and then we do need to move on so we can get to the end, but how yeah. large would the sunny cloudy day difference be typically? Oh, um, from high, it, it varies on crops. Um, so, I mean, even ideal brick levels, one of the things you need to know with a refractometer is you need to know what it actually is. So like a vine crop, you can have a bricks of 25, 26, that's actually pretty good. You will never ever see that sort of level on many vegetable crops. Um, they just don't achieve that sort of level of bricks. It's all relevant to, um, but you could easily see a 50, 60% drop from a sunny day to a dull day. It can be a massive difference. So this is the key to understanding when we go back to the original discussion we had about from Dr. Callahan and understanding 
um, why uh, you know the, the why do insects feed on plants with that staccato pulse because that plant has low bricks because it doesn't have nutrient density it's unbalanced therefore it's giving off that signal the reason insects won't go and feed on the plants with high bricks is that basically I mean I, I wrote this in a very um, from a, a, I guess in a very correct way but there's certainly enormous amounts of evidence that insects um, will be killed when they try to digest the complex carbohydrates present in high bricks plants this is due to the lack of a pancreas with no pancreatic enzyme management. Alcohol is produced in the gut and is invariably a poison to the insect. And there have been, I, I haven't actually been able to um, have the opportunity to trial it myself. Often when I'm looking for insects, we can't find these pests, um, which is a problem we've had at times for years. Um, but you could take a caterpillar from uh, that you found in the garden and put on a leaf um, with a high bricks level and put it in, uh, in a, an environment um, and watch that process um, actually occur where they die through ingesting high bricks levels. So that's a fermentation process, isn't it, Daniel? Yeah, essentially they can't manage those high sugars and nature has designed them to eat the garbage. So they eat the low bricks, low value um, plants and therefore they survive and carry on their job as garbage collectors. But if you have high bricks plants, you have very, very, and we've seen some very good examples of that within the UFA at times, various different people have experienced the result of continuing to apply um, uh, products to raise the, um, the bricks of, of plants and have actually dealt with um, insect attack just simply by lifting bricks levels. I haven't added all those solutions into this because we just simply don't have time. What I want people from this is to understand some of the science around why we have to look at what we're doing and, and approach things. Uh, we can do things a, a lot more effectively if we actually uh, work with nature um, uh, as we understand it. So here's now we have, it's, it's, um, we have three more minutes. So I'm predicting, Daniel, that you're going to take probably another eight minutes to finish this. So I'm just letting people know um, and carry on. <laughs> okay. So another, a really traditional, so I've shown you bricks meter, which a lot of people know about refractometers, but actually lots of people have them, but never use them. Probably 90% of people are, that, that have them actually never use them because they forget about them and don't completely understand their importance. The SAT pH meter, although I have them and we have had um, people use them, again, they're very rarely understood and used, yet that science is, is not well understood. Most people understand chemistry and pesticides rather than um, SAT pHs and, and insect susceptibility. So the most common form of, of plant analysis is what we call a leaf testing, or a, you know, it's, it's a leaf analysis. So what we're looking at here is a leaf analysis and leaf analysis, not soil analysis. Um, I've just hidden, uh, obviously, who this is from, and um, I'm not necessarily I'm not the lab that did it, unfortunately. Um, but uh, you know, so we were getting a, a report from a lab. This happens to be on a clover sample um, that was only sent to me in, in the last um, week um, uh, from a dairy farmer. So he sent me this, um, and I, I've been working with him for quite a number of years. So he he knew enough to do a single species leaf analysis, which is clover, and I'll explain the importance of doing single species. And then he did a, a, a feed analysis. So it was like taking a whole handful of the grass of all the species to get to work trying to work out what the animal is eating. And his message to me, um, it was text to me, saying, oh, I'm low in nitrogen, what can we do? Um, I'll send you the leaf analysis. And so what he was looking at is, he was looking at this, this figure here is nitrogen, he's looking at 3.3, and they're saying the median range is four to five, so oh, that's terribly low, we've got problems. And he was looking up here in, in, in nitrogen, although I don't know why he was getting quite so panicked about it. This is actually showing it's not bad nitrogen levels. They, they do appear to be a little bit on the low side, but he was only, remember he's testing all these other things, but he was only actually looking at nitrogen in the whole conversation. Unfortunately, he was a dairy farmer. Um, and the other thing he looked at in terms of nitrogen is crude protein, because the, the lower nitrogen relates to um, lower crude um, protein. But the interesting thing, again, we've got a figure here of 20 uh, to 30, so he's at the lower end of it, but you know, you, it's not technically deficient. Maybe in this point he is. But 
the big problem is, and this is the this is the Achilles heel of leaf analysis, a little bit like soil analysis, is that these figures that run down this page, we call the medium range. What the lab is giving you is basically the average of what would normally be found in that type of sample. The problem is when the industry applies excessive amounts of nitrogen, the medium range is excessively high. The actual, when we start, when we start graphing, looking for nutrient uh, levels and balance, we use what's called the acceptable or technically the ideal range. This is a range that has been through research worked out to be what's appropriate. In this case, it was for, for white clover. Appropriate for what, Daniel? Appropriate Sorry. for leaf growth? Is it appropriate, appropriate for a healthy, for, for the, the, the best range of nutrients found to grow that particular plant. So when they, what you do is your leaf analysis, typically people have leaf analysis when the plant is very sickly or not looking so good. So imagine if you took leaf analysis when the plant was actually looking fantastic, you would have a range of uh, levels where the plant was actually performing at a very, very, uh, its highest growth potential. So we call that an ideal range. Um, what we're trying to do is find, we're trying to make the conditions ideal. So if we put more nitrogen into this crop, <clears throat> well, it doesn't need it. it. It shows quite clearly that it's actually at the, it's actually at the upper end of the um, ideal range. The last thing this crop needs is nitrogen. Um, and how does that correspond to crude protein? Well, the problem is the 20 to 30% they're looking for in crude protein is again typically what they will find for feed values because they're using excess nitrogen. The average feed value has excess protein. The animal, if you talk to animal, animal nutritionist specialists and, and ruminants, they will tell you that more like 16 to 18% is the maximum that they can actually digest so that when you have excess crude protein, the animal can, you create a whole lot of subclinical conditions of lameness and mastitis and a range of other things are associated with trying to feed an animal excess protein all the time, um, which is unfortunately the conventional model um, when somebody is given the information without understanding um, what the numbers actually mean on, on the page. Um, and this is, so, you know, this is unfortunately the, the, the Achilles heel of um, this otherwise very useful tool is the fact that we don't want to be ever looking at the average of what everybody is doing. We need to actually be looking at the ideal of what we, of what that plant or animal needs. So this is um, the last slide. Uh, that we've got to discuss. And again, um, I've shown this um, before, um, but this is trying to highlight again the advantages of actually understanding the microbial system, understanding the soil system, and actually utilizing that science is that with the current approach, which you call cultivated land, which is basically following the conventional model of, of uh, cultivation and, and agrochemicals and um, and our current productivity um, they're talking about here is um, uh, grams of, of dry above ground biomass per square meter um, per year uh, as they look at 650. Nature left on its own as a tropical rainforest is basically um, you know, three and a half times more effective. Swamp and marsh is, is that much more um, productive. Um, we come along with all our big machinery and chemistry and actually um, underperform nature massively. When we actually start utilizing our understanding of the science, the, the, this biological um, system that plants and soil is, uh, in the first year, we see, we call that transitional, we can outperform um, in, uh, you know, by, um, what's that, that's three, um, you know, three times uh, what we were doing um, previously. But the great thing suddenly comes, we're here, we were either carbon neutral or, or, or often um, carbon negative, so we're losing a carbon, and I should really have a figure there. When we go down here, we start following and utilizing and the understanding of the carbon process, and the microbial process, suddenly we find ourselves that we can actually sequester huge amounts of carbon. Once we've done it for three years, and this is what they're calling the advanced model uh, of utilizing 
the understanding uh, that we're talking about here in the sciences, you know, now we're outperforming our original uh, cultivated land process by six times. But look at the amount of, of carbon that we've actually got sequester sequestering per hectare every year. Um, you know, the, the ability of, of, of the food system to actually be incredibly um, productive, um, our ability to produce um, you know, vastly more food uh, per square meter per hectare um, to feed this planet, but do it in such a way that we're actually positively impacting the ecological system, uh, even just if you're only measuring in terms of carbon. You know, it's a massive, massive potential that we're um, showing what, what is really possible if we embrace um, the science, if we embrace uh, what we're, we're, we're learning about the natural system. And that is... So we me. have some great questions here. And I think um, uh, the first of all is, uh, where can we find info on acceptable ranges in regards to um, the leaf analysis? Okay. Um, there are... There is a manual um, that I have been trying to get hold of from the CRSO, um, which NTS use. In some cases, we research the, um, the levels from different um, crops um, to come up with the ranges that are ideal from uh, research that has been to look at for that specific reason. Um, in my case, if I fail, I also use the, uh, in my case, I use the agronomy department at NTS and give them a call. I've got a range of templates for various different crops. Um, for some crops, there's a lot of known ranges. Other times we have to use a crop that's closely related. Um, so it's always, uh, for, for leaf analysis, that's what we're um, looking at. But I can provide, I can provide a lot of those um, from uh, our, our current templates. So we can make that available on the WhatsApp channel, but also we're starting to create a resources page, and, which Angela Fleming is, is yep. managing, and, and we could put that in there. There's um, one question that I'll get you to have a look at because it's quite compl complicated. Um, there's a question again, so we can do all of this, and they're referring to the higher biomass production uh, without the use of animals. Um, I, in fact, repeated the question. The carbon sequestration that you referred to, Daniel, does this happen in the absence of animals? Well, I guess it depends on what you call animals. <laughs> um, if we're talking about, it can it occur in the pre, in the, you know, in the, um, it can occur in the presence of ruminants. It can occur in the uh, in in a situation where ruminants don't exist. If we're thinking in terms of cows. Um, it's about how you manage that system. I don't think in any way, shape or form that we can look at animals as being negative um, to our ecological system because they are part of it. But in some, you can look at some things like, uh, you know, in some forest systems, there is very little in the way of, of animals they're full of birds as new zealand was but it, there's all sorts of different ways of cycling the nutrition um yeah so the answer is yes and no now there's another question but i would prefer you to look it up on your chat channel if you can um daniel because it's actually written in a in a way that i don't feel confident that i can read out to you um but i think okay. it's a great question right um how analogous are host organisms and symbiotic microbial partners regarding nutrient energy exchange plus minus the outcomes rolling from microbiome plant roots and raw compared with animal gut nutrient exchange? How? Um, hmm. So, do you want to repeat the question in a simple way for others and then proceed to I, attempt I, to answer it? <laughs> yeah, um, I guess if I just, just reading that quickly my understanding would be that when we're talking about um, symbiotic organisms um, and we're comparing the microbiomes of plant roots, um, the rhizosphere, and compared with animal gut and nutrient exchange and mutual benefits, there isn't, um, there isn't actually, in the end of the day, a huge amount of difference. Um, from the point of view as to how the microbial system works 
within us versus um, plants or with animals um, and gut, you get different uh, systems. So you get some systems that operate as anaerobic systems, and that can be within, um, uh, within the, the plant um, nature as well as the animal gut, and you can get other systems which are aerobic, but the balance between pathogens and um, beneficials and the roles that they play and the, the benefits are very, very closely um, related in terms of outcomes. Um, so by pouring a lot of negative chemistry into our own bodies from the point of view of destroying our gut biome has um, more or less exactly the same response that we were talking about um, having a negative effect on the soil microbiome. Um, it is all about um, microbiological um, health. Um, one of the examples, I guess I would lastly say on this just quickly, is that as a human, we are, um, if we count the cells in our bodies, we are 90% bacterial and 10% human. So as we live and breathe and stand and walk, there we have 90%, nine to one bacterial to human cells. And when we count the DNA that we walk around with, it is actually 99% uh, of the DNA we walk around with uh, is actually bacterial, 1% is human. Um, so whatever we're talking about, plants or animals, it is all about um, the balance between the beneficials and the pathogens. Great. Hope that, that answers wonderful. the question. <laughs> so, um, Daniel, I just really um, want to thank you for, um, again, putting together such a, an interesting uh, uh, masterclass for us. Um, thank you for being somebody who's been so willing to learn yourself um, that you are able to share with us um, the, this journey of, of learning how the, the farming uh, systems that we are all trying to become highly skilled at actually function. Um, I really thank all of you who've stayed um, to ask questions. Um, your questions enable us to go a little deeper. And um, we uh, will be back uh, and letting you know where we're going to proceed from here. We've done three masterclasses now and we will be looking for uh, funding to be able to continue to do this. Um, but please join us on the, the Farmer in the Fields. And if you want to um, become part of this community, reach out through the UFA and, um, and join in our WhatsApp group. Happy growing. And thank you, Daniel, so much. You're welcome. Uh, it's uh, always an enjoyable um, thing to learn together. So uh, look forward to doing it again in the future sometime.